Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let us all say amen. amen. If you would, church, please turn with me. Uh, can we just sing one more? Amen. 386. Jesus is coming soon. I, I don't think I need to remind us of the sense of urgency uh, in our daily living. Amen. In our holy conversation to be mindful of the fact. I want to make sure I get this right. There we go. Green light. To be mindful of the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. 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 Uh, page 386. Verses 1 and 2. Amen. Amen. Trouble sometimes, oh, here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we own, oh, dear, now with that sting. Humbling your heart to God, saves from the chest. Seek the way, pilgrims, trod Christians away. My Jesus is coming soon, morning or night. Oh, new many will meet. <clears throat> and all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be all oh, happy forever. When we meet on that show, free from all care, rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye, onward we then shall fly, glory to share. My Jesus is coming soon, morning or night. Oh, noon, many will meet them, and trumpets will sound. And all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. My Jesus is coming soon, morning or night. Oh, noon, many will meet them, and trumpets will sound. And all of the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the sky, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Amen. We sing the way that we sing we pray the way that we pray with the spirit and with the understanding because we know and we believe that jesus is coming soon amen we live the way that we live we are obedient to the degree that we are because everything every fiber and every facet of our christianity is an observance of the fact that one day we all will stand before our Lord and Savior. We will give an account of all of the deeds that have been committed in this body, whether they be good or whether they be evil. Everything points to the fact that Jesus is coming soon. And just last week we were singing an old time hymn, When Jesus Comes to Reward His Servant. Whether it be noon or night, faithful to him will he find us watching with our lamps all trimmed and bright. The songwriter asked the question, he said, oh brother, can we say that we are ready? Are we ready for the soul's bright home? Say when he comes, will he find you and me still watching? And waiting when the Lord shall come. Amen? Amen. And this morning I want to, just for a few brief moments, I, I felt so bad the last time. I Let me tell you all a secret about me. I love preaching. Amen? Amen? Amen. Uh, the, the, the Lord handpicked 
my vocation and handed it to me. Amen. I enjoy dispersing the word of God so much that I lose track of time. I don't intend to be a long-winded preacher, but sometimes it just happens. But this time, I'm watching the clock at the beginning of the sermon. The last time, I looked at the clock, and I couldn't remember what time I got up. And I think I still had my mic on. I leaned over and I asked my wife, I said, how long did I preach? Because I'm always self-conscious about uh, the presentation of God's word. Amen? I, I want the presentation of God's word to reside with you I, I want you to leave inspired and not dog tired amen in the book of john and we're going to bounce between john and luke amen uh, i'm coming down there with y'all amen luke chapter excuse me first john chapter 20 where the scripture reading has been so beautifully read there's only one point that i want to make on New Year's Eve. The world has positioned itself in such a way and in such a place that there is no room for Jesus. I was reading in the book of Luke and I see a newlywed couple and I see a pregnant expecting mother and as they are journeying she has gone into labor and they have gone to an inn as the father is trying to find shelter and a residence a place for his wife to be able to give birth and as he has Gone to inquire from the innkeeper. Amen. The bell hop at the holiday inn. Y'all know what I'm saying. The sign out front said, no vacancy. Now don't look for that in the text. Now I'm saying that so you can understand the nature of this situation. And what has happened with that particular inn is that there is no room for them. There's no place for Jesus. Funnily enough, in that same exact book, about seven chapters later, Jesus is getting ready to pass through a village of the Samaritans. And if you remember, historically, the Jews and the Samaritans are like oil and water. They do not mix. But Jesus sends his disciples to inquire in the village of the Samaritans and almost in a way to make reservations. But his disciples come back and they said, Master, they will not receive you in this village. We ask ourselves, what has happened to our world today? That there's no room for Jesus. If you are here this morning, if you have at least one strand of gray hair, just one, then at some point in time, you and I have both asked ourselves, what is so different about the generations that we see now versus where we came from? I'm going to tell you the answer to that in just a moment. Stay tuned. Because there is an answer to that question. The answer to that question we find is not only taking hold in the world, but it's slowly taking grasp and gaining traction in the church. But there's a solution to this problem. 
So my math teacher promised me, my math teacher in the seventh grade, she, Ms. Harris promised me. She said, James, I promise you, to every problem, there is a solution. What we have to focus on is finding the solution. Amen? Sometimes we get wrapped up in complaining about the problem. Sometimes we get so engulfed and so engrossed in complaining about the problem, we forget to look for the solution because we found it so entertaining. It has become so captivating. That's how a pity party gets started. Amen, somebody. That's how a pity party gets started because we've gotten so wrapped up in the complaint about what's going on that we forgot to do anything about it. So we come to John the 20th chapter. And here in John the 20th chapter, I see the same concerned woman. Thank God for the sisters. Amen. Amen. Because sometimes us brothers, we miss it. Amen, somebody. There have been a many a times that some sisters have had to pull us to the side and just have a conversation. Amen, brothers. There have been some God-fearing women in the church that have had to pull us to the side and just talk to us. I have seen brothers in congregation that have not gotten along in 25 years. The preachers couldn't do it. The deacons couldn't do it. The elders couldn't do it. Nobody could help them get themselves together. But guess what? One of the sisters was able to reason with the brothers. Amen. Thank you, sir. See, I'm going to hand it to the sisters. Amen. And so in John chapter 20, I want to point out something to you that I just found to be just captivating and fascinating. Amen. Verses number one says, now the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. Saw that the stone. Had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter. And the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And, and in this book, that is John. I just want to point that out. John is a very, very humble writer. John's intent in his writing is to speak of the Lord and not of himself. And so when John speaks of the Lord in the text, you almost never hear John ever refer to himself. John calls himself the other disciple. John says, my name is not important. The name that you need to know is Jesus. And so he said, the other disciple that Jesus loved and said to them, listen now, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. Notice she says, we do not know. Did y'all catch that? Yes. We do not know. Mary Magdalene is speaking on behalf of herself, Josana, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. I cannot imagine what Mary, the mother of Jesus, went through. Having to see, you know, Mary, Mary went through a lot. Let me just tell you, all the Christian mothers here this morning, all the mothers, amen. That they are trying their best to have raised young Christian men and young Christian women. Let me tell you something. You, that, that, that is a tenfold double duty. Because it's not just getting the job done. It's how you get the job done. And Mary, I mean, if you just look through the book. Look, I mean, a couple of times here, Mary has gone through it. One time she lost her child. Supposing that a child is amongst the kinsmen, amongst the, the family members, maybe a couple of church members, playing with some of the church members' kids and lost her child. 
But let me tell you how you know when you got it right. Guess where they found him at? They found him in the temple. They found him in a place of worship. If there ever is a place where you want your family, you want your children, you want your spouse, you want your life to be comfort, it should be in the presence of God. So when they find Jesus, they find him in the temple. I can't imagine how she felt standing in front of a cross watching her child be crucified. When her son says, behold, thy son. But let me show you the concern. Let me show you what concerns sisters, how they respond. Are you ready? Mary Magdalene has carried word back to the disciples. Notice the first thing is first. Mary Magdalene was the first one to come to the tomb. Let me just point that out. Mary Magdalene was so concerned, she came to the cemetery while it was still dark. See, she got me beat right there. I'm not going to the cemetery while it's dark. If I go to bring some flowers, anything, I'm coming during daylight hours while somebody is there. No, I'm not scared of the cemetery. I just ain't going when it's dark. But Mary went early in the morning, the first day of the week. And when Mary arrives at the tomb, Mary sees that the stone has been rolled away. The body of Jesus is not there. She goes to Peter. She goes to John. She tells them what has taken place. But the sense of urgency in her voice, I don't know which translation of the Bible you have, but in the New King James, there's an exclamation point there. They have taken away the Lord and we don't know where they have laid him. But I want you to see what happens right after this. After the disciples have come to the tomb. Literally, Peter and John were in a foot race trying to get to the tomb. And when they got there, John looked in, but Peter stepped in. Right there, Peter's got me beat because I would have probably showed up But there's no way I would have stepped down into the tomb. Makes me ask myself a question. Why would Peter go inside? See, there's always going to be somebody that's willing to go a step further. And all I can tell you is that that is the same Peter that was on the boat. Who when Jesus was walking on the water, that is the same Peter, while the rest of the disciples are arguing about whether it's a spirit, whether it's a ghost, whether it's Jesus. I think, I feel, I believe. Peter was the one that said, Lord, if that's you, let me come out there. And Jesus yelled back, come on. And out of all of the disciples that are on the boat, the only one that steps out of the boat is Peter. While everybody else is speculating, Peter is walking on the water. While everybody else has an opinion, Peter is walking on the water. While everybody else is astonished, Peter is walking on the water. While everybody else marvels, Peter was walking. Out of all of the disciples, the only one that got out was Peter. That's the same Peter who in all of his own humanity 
walked with Jesus for three years. And this is why I tell members of the church, be firm with yourself. Don't beat yourself up. But be firm with yourself and be honest with yourself. Your idea of perfection and God's vision of perfection are two completely different things. I want to make sure we're on the same page with that. Peter walked with Jesus, sat at Jesus' feet, ate with Jesus, talked with Jesus for three and a half years, and still cut a man in front of Jesus. He said, Jesus, I'm going to go with you. I'll be there with you. They crucified you. They got to crucify me too. I'm I'm, I'm here with you. I'm in it for the long haul. Kind of sounds like us with a New Year's resolution, doesn't it? (laughs) Jesus says, before the sun rises, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me. No, Lord, I'm not going to deny you. I'm so serious about this. I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I I was in the Garden of Gethsemane with you. Lord, I'm with you all the way. All it took was for somebody in the audience to say, hey, isn't he one of them? That's one of his disciples right there. And the Bible says that Peter denied the Lord to the point that he began cursing. Now, let's get this straight. Now, three and a half years, you've been with Jesus in person. And you have cut somebody, denied the Lord, and cussed all in the same night. But do you know how Peter got to where he is here? Let me tell you how Peter got here. It was something specific that Jesus said to him, something specific that Jesus did. And this is what it's going to take for 2024. Y'all ready? That same night that he cut a man, denied Jesus, and cussed all at the same night. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan's desire is to have you and to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. Now, put a little asterisk right there. Highlight that in your Bible. Because that was the Lord's prayer. Y'all hear what it said? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is not the Lord's prayer. That was a prayer of example. Now, I know there's a beautiful little caption in most of your Bible that says the Lord's Prayer. But Jesus didn't put that there. Jesus says, I have prayed for you. That was the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus said, I have prayed for you. Listen now, here it is. That your faith fail not. Because even if you fail, That's fine. You're going to have to fail to learn. You're going to have to fail to grow. You're going to have to fail to understand. But I pray for you that your faith doesn't fail. Because if your faith does not fail, when you fall down, you will get back up. When you make a mistake, you will ask for forgiveness. When you err from the faith, you will repent as long as your faith Fails not. Because Satan's desire is to have you and to sift you like wheat. They're just really quickly on just a, a quick little tangent. The sifting process, when they talk about sifting the wheat, that's not like when, how we sift flour when we're baking. Not the same sifting. This is much more violent. When they gather the wheat, you remember the scripture that says, Gather the wheat and the chaff together and I will separate when I come. Y'all remember that scripture? Watch this. They gather the wheat and the chaff together. And to the untrained eye, honestly, the wheat and the chaff look identical. 
But when they are sifted, they respond differently. Now, they gather the wheat and they gather the chaff together and they literally beat the wheat and the chaff on the threshing floor. And as the wheat and the chaff are beaten, the wind blows and it blows the chaff away. But the wheat will fall to the ground. Y'all catch that? So when Satan has you and Satan is sifting you, when Satan is beating the daylights out of you, if you are weak and not chaff, don't just blow away. Fall down on your knees and pray. That is what separates the weak from the chaff. It's the response you give. That's what the Lord is looking for. The response that Mary gave in John chapter 20. If you notice, the Bible says that the disciples went back home. Mm -hmm. The Bible says the disciples departed back to their homes. And Mary was still there. Somebody else has come. She doesn't know who it is. She's seen the angels and and the angels have have even asked her, why are you weeping? There's a young man that's walking up behind her. She doesn't even know he's there yet. He's walking slowly. She can't hear his footsteps, but his presence is there. The angels have said, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? That was my last point. They've taken away Jesus out of school. They've taken away Jesus from the job. They've taken away Jesus from the Christian home. They've taken away Jesus from the adoption agent. What do you mean, brother preacher? I mean, a homosexual couple can adopt a child now. The world says it's okay to have two mommies and two daddies. They've taken away Jesus. They've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. Ask Paul. Paul will tell you in Romans chapter 1, they did not like to retain the knowledge of God in their heart. They've taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. But watch this. When she discovered that this young man was standing behind her, she acknowledges that he's there. She thought he was the gardener. She said, You have taken my Lord. Just tell me where you have laid him. I will go and get him myself. That's a concerned sister talking. So much that she didn't even think about the probability of what she was proposing. This is how we know that when we say stuff in faith, it does not matter what the rest of the world thinks or says. Don't depend, don't hinge your faith on the world's understanding. They had wrapped Jesus with a hundred pounds of spikenard and ointment when they buried him. Jesus would have been well over 300 pounds or more to carry. How would one woman carry that much weight? But her willingness, her willingness to serve is what she's speaking of. And so what she says is, if you have taken him, just tell me where you have laid him and I will go and get him. Then Jesus revealed himself to her. He called her by her name. 
And he said, Mary. And when he calls her name, she recognizes his voice. And lo and behold, there is her resurrected Savior. If we're going to make it in 2024, we are going to have to do it every step of the way in faith. Don't predicate your faith. Don't base your faith on the world's understanding. I just showed you in, in, in the book of, of Luke, the ninth chapter, the world won't even accept Jesus. When he sends his own disciples, the world won't even accept him. The disciples have to come back and tell Jesus that the world didn't want you. You know what Jesus did? He shook the dust off his feet and went to the next city. 2024, I believe, is going to be a wonderful year for the people of God. But the only way that it works, it has to be hinged on faith. If we don't believe, we will not receive. And Jesus literally said, you have not because you asked not. Now, to answer the question about the generations, what has happened and what is happening with the generations of the world and now somewhat with the generations of the church. I'm going to tell you why the older generations were so much stronger than we are. One very basic, simple principle. The Lord says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. But we have a phobia about weakness. We are afraid to be weak. See, there were some Christians that couldn't read and write. that had more faith than we do. There were some Christians that could barely speak a lick of English. that had more faith than we do. That believed better than we. That trusted God more than we ever could comprehend. There were some people that didn't have jobs that depended on the earth for their food source. Sit down to the table every meal and ask the blessed and thank the Lord for what he's provided. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. We go through the drive through at McDonald's and Burger King, Wendy's. Hey, man, keep from cooking. KFC, keep from cooking. We, 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 we go everywhere. You know, out of all of the convenience that we have in 2023, we forget to ask the blessing 90% of the time. Because we have stopped depending on the Lord's strength at the time of our weakness. We don't want to acknowledge our weaknesses anymore. Somebody just come by and just ask us, are you doing okay? Are you feeling okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Head hurting like I don't know what. I'm fine. Ain't eight and three, two, three days. Don't have no appetite. Got the flu, coughing, feet hurting, head hurting, back hurting, neck hurting. I'm fine. We slouch down in the gym. Are you okay? I'm fine. We don't even want to acknowledge when something's not right. We have a phobia about weakness. But the word of the Lord remains true. He said, my strength is perfected in your weakness. When we discover what our weaknesses are, when we acknowledge what our weaknesses are, James chapter 5, confess your faults one to another and pray that you may be healed. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm not going to read it for you. I'm going to tell you this is your homework until the next time I see you. Read Revelations, the third chapter. There was some people, some church people. There was a congregation in Revelation, the third chapter. I'm fine. I'm rich. I'm increased in goods. I have no need of nothing. And Jesus says, you don't even realize you are poor, blind, miserable, naked. And the whole time they're sitting there saying, 
I'm fine. Don't be that congregation. Because what happens is that is the congregation that rejects the Lord. The problem in that congregation, they've taken away my Lord. The reason they're dying, they've taken away my Lord. I know not where they have lived. If you are here this morning, if you stand a guilty distance from God, Look around in your home. Look amongst your children. Look in your marriage. Look at your job. Look everywhere in your life. Every corner. Have they taken away my Lord? If you are standing a guilty distance, make it right right now. This is not a, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow thing. Tomorrow's not promised. You only got two days. Two days. Those are only two days that you have. Two days. You have this day because God has already given it to you. And then you have that day. And the Bible says, and in that day, there will be many that will say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not done many marvelous things, prophesied and cast out demons in thy name? And I will say, I never knew you. Those are only two days you have. The day that the Lord has already given you. Thank God your eyes are open. You are here. Sickness and in health, amen, but we are here. But the other day is the day that is appointed unto us to stand before the Lord to give an account as a faithful servant. If you stand a guilty distance from God, if you have not obeyed the gospel, you come to God by hearing and believing. And I don't want the plan of salvation to intimidate anybody because literally you're already halfway through it right now. You have heard the gospel. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. After you've heard the gospel, you should believe what you've heard. Acts chapter 15 and verses number 7. After there had been much disputing, Peter rose and said, Men and brethren, you know a good while ago how God made choice among us. But by the words of my mouth, you must hear and believe. Well, after you've heard and believed the gospel, it should prick your heart. It should convict your conscience. You should be ready to repent. You should be ready for a change. It's time to change your life. It's time to change your mind. It's time to change your ways. But you can't do it without God. You've been trying to do it on your own and it hasn't worked out yet. Just be real with me. It hasn't, has it? I got news for you. It's not going to work out tomorrow until you put the Lord where he belongs in your life. Until we change our minds, until we change our hearts, our opinions and our feelings are never going to change. And speaking of feelings, if you are, listen to me, this sounds so absurd. It sounds so crazy when you say it this way, but I want you to see the absurdity of the thought. If you are still looking for a feeling, Y'all going to catch that on the way home. There are some people that have not turned their lives over to Christ. They say, I'm looking for a feeling. I'm waiting on a feeling. When I feel it in my heart, you're looking for a feeling? Somebody just explain that to me. How does that work? How do you see a feeling? 30 years of preaching, I still haven't discovered that yet. How do you see a feeling? You're looking for a feeling. You're going to wind up dead and ain't never going to see it. But if you're ready to repent, if you're ready to change your mind, if you're ready to change your life. Jesus has left you a message. Personally wrote it, hand delivered to you by a man named John the Revelator. Jesus even signed it. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Unto him that will open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. That's the letter that Jesus wrote to you over 2,000 years ago. Signed it and left it right here for you in 2023. I'm waiting on you. Heaven's ready. Father's ready. Holy Spirit's ready. And I'm ready. We're waiting on you. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verses 38, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And the remission of sin not only is the forgiveness of sin. Notice the Bible says remission of sin, meaning that the sin has no more power or dominion over you. That's how we're going to get the change in there. After which, confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I don't have to tell people all the stuff I did wrong. No, you do not. Confession is that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you need to see a textbook example of it, go to Acts chapter 8. As Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch were riding in the chariot, he said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? He says, well, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Here's confession right here. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's confession. He commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Balls in your court, Acts 22 and 16. Now why tarriest thou? What are you waiting for? Are you still looking for a feeling? He said, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, washing away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. Jesus literally said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I'll receive you unto myself. If you are here this morning, I believe the song of invitation has already been said. Will you come as we stand and sing the song of encouragement?